Welcome to the second event of the Spring uh, Speaker Series of the Program in Criminal Justice. My name is Sandra Susan Smith. I'm the faculty chair of the program um, and excited to be a moderator for today's session. Um, so we are in the midst of an, another uh, discussion around police brutality. Uh, often what comes up in these discussions is a, uh, it's a debates about the role of police training and how we need to invest more and the kinds of training we need to engage in, in order to produce results that better results, more humane results, less harmful results. Almost certainly that will be centered in the more recent conversations related to Tyree Nichols murder um, from earlier this year. Uh, the question is, <clears throat> what role does training play in helping us to understand the brutality that too many um, face um, in this country? Um, I'm really thrilled. <clears throat> thrilled might not. Uh, I'm thrilled to have Jessica here. Not so thrilled about the topic that we have to engage in. Although, really looking forward to the insights that um, have emerged from Jessica's research. Jessica Katz Katzenstein is a Harvard inequality. In America Initiative postdoctoral fellow. That's a mouthful. Jessica comes to us from Brown University, where in 2020, uh, 2022, she received her PhD in anthropology. Her research traces how U.S. police officers absorb and resist reforms during a mounting legitimacy crisis in order to understand why reforms perpetually fail to realize their promises to curb racialized violence. A good part of her research focuses on the training um, um, that they receive. Um, and how that informs the ways in which they engage um, in, in the broader public in discourses around uh, police common sense, et cetera. Jessica uh, comes to us at, uh, at, uh, at a perfect time um, when we're all trying to make sense of the most recent uh, experience of brutality, um, one of what seems like many and um, at a pace that seems much quicker than we've seen in the recent past. Um, I'm very much looking forward to learning from uh, uh, Jessica today, and I'm sure that you all are as well. Um, as Jessica uh, prepares her talk, please don't hesitate to drop questions in the, the chat along the way so that we can collect those and engage with uh, Jessica once her talk is over. Um, I will probably follow up um, immediately with one or two questions of my own before opening Q&A for everyone to participate. Very much looking forward to this conversation. Jessica, um, it's really great to finally have you here. Can't wait to hear your talk um, and to learn more from you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you for that um, kind introduction. I'm I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. Such a um, yeah, and to be with such a great interdisciplinary audience um, is is really exciting. And um, yeah, this moment, of course, is uh, yeah, showing how I think important these kinds of conversations are. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. That's working okay? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so this talk uh, is called The Ethnographic Realities of Police Reform. Um, I'll talk for about 40 minutes and then I'll really look forward to your questions. Um, the paper that this is based on is also a work in progress, so I'm particularly um, interested in um, any questions or challenges that, that folks might have. So about 10 years before Memphis police officers killed Thierry Nichols, the department altered its yearly in-service training to add Krav Maga combat training and to double the amount of time officers spend in shoot or don't shoot scenario trainings, which purport to teach officers decision-making and restraint. These trainings were designed to decrease shootings by officers and increase the chances that, as a local news station put it, officers can disarm suspects, get them into custody without having to make any life or death decisions. Since then, the department also mandated use of force reporting and de-escalation training, banned chokeholds, authorized body cameras, and implemented a duty to intervene policy, which required officers to stop their colleagues' excessive force. The department's slick reimagining policing site <clears throat> now touts its majority black force, reports on its use of force statistics, and declares that, as you can see, we want to listen and do the work to promote the safe and effective delivery of police services. On January 7th, five officers from the elite Scorpion unit of MPD in full view of their body cams beat Tyree Nichols to death. 
After videos of Nichols' killing were publicized last week, a cavalcade of public figures called for systemic police reform, including better training. Democratic Senator Dick Durbin advocated for federal police reform bills demanding more training to change the culture of police violence. The NAACP Memphis president said, quote, we just need to focus back on training. We had a reimagining law enforcement committee which put forth some of these plans. So I think we just have to implement them to prevent these kinds of tragedies, end quote. <clears throat> a Tennessee state representative argued, and I'm quoting again, we need to figure out what kind of training is done, what kind of training needs to be done, and if there needs to be some tweaking. Despite increasing challenges to such responses, they remain common practice after police killings of Black Americans. Reformers call for de-escalation training, bystander intervention training, communication, community sensitivity, use of force training, implicit bias training. Where the department in question already has stringent training policies in place like Memphis PD, commentators insist that such policies must be enforced or perhaps tweaked to finally achieve their goal of mitigating police killings of black people with fatal shootings alone at a reported decade record high in 2022. So in this talk, I will explore some ethnographic realities of the scenario trainings that are so often pushed in the wake of, these, of this violence, um, one of the hallmark types of trainings that we often see proposed. In scenario or what is sometimes called reality-based exercises, officers immersively act out real life scenarios such as making arrests, de-escalating arguments, or deciding whether to shoot someone. Scenarios may involve in-person role-playing or virtual reality simulators and often feature prominently in SWAT team practices and training sites such as police academies. Reformers hail scenario trainings as particularly promising modalities for teaching judicious uses of force and suppressing fear. Such trainings are often designed to instill a guardian orientation in which officers' primary mandate is to protect civilians and to counter a pervasive warrior training style in which police are taught to anticipate ever-present threats to their own survival. For instance, the officers who killed Michael Brown, Stephon Clark, Walter Scott, Terrence Crutcher, Jonathan Farrell, Tamir Rice, and Philando Castile, just to name a few, justify their actions on the basis of, quote, reasonable fear that their personal safety was threatened. Case law, as I'm sure many people on this call are very familiar, um, scaffolds this framing. Officer safety concerns have legally sanctified countless police killings. After such killings, reformers have often criticized the trainings that purportedly incubate such fear, arguing that officer survival trainings transform police into militarized warriors hyper alert to threat with deadly consequences for criminalized communities of color. For instance, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Prey announced in 2019 that the city's police officers were prohibited from attending, quote, fear-based warrior style training after investigations revealed that officer Geronimo Yanez had participated in a private training course called the Bulletproof Warrior two years before killing Philando Castile in a Minneapolis suburb. The course taught officers how to anticipate and survive combat in a time of purportedly skyrocketing violence against police. As an antidote to these warrior style trainings, Scenario trainings purport to teach calibrated uses of force and counter police discrimination by allowing officers to rehearse reality, therefore subverting the fear and bias induced by suddenly confronting the unknown. Reformist paradigms don't exclude officer safety concerns from scenario trainings, but rather attempt to decenter them in order to minimize racialized violence. During my fieldwork from 2015 to 2018 with police departments in Maryland, I observed scenario exercises in academies, active shooter trainings, and SWAT practices. As I will argue today, the realities that are constructed within these reality-based trainings, contra reformer aspirations, shape, reorient, and even intensify officer fear rather than suppressing it. Fear-based warrior-style thinking seemingly leaks into reform-oriented scenario training. Officer safety encloses and forecloses all other considerations. This leakage is not merely a failure of effective reform, remediable by neutralizing fear with stronger doses of reality. Rather, I argue that it demonstrates how at the heart of modern US policing lies what I call police common sense, a nominally colorblind epistemological framework that transforms anti-Black police violence into a mere technical concern, 
and asserts the primacy of officer survival. Scenario trainings recruit police into police common sense by materializing threat and by rendering the violence required to face it a matter of pragmatic, colorblind common sense. Police common sense holds threat as potentially emergent from any body, even as its mandates for controlling threat rest on anti-Black racial imaginaries. By inculcating police common sense, scenario trainings epitomize how US policing absorbs and translates reform. Abolitionists and many critical scholars of police violence argue that US police reform can only reimagine policing on its own terms, offering pacifying gestures while preserving its foundational mandates to control poor communities of color and enforce existing property relations. I build on this insight by arguing that police common sense prevents scenario training reforms from achieving their desired impact by securing epistemic closure against threatened shifts in the status quo. In other words, by producing a commonsensical and irrefutable vision of the world, police common sense naturalizes certain forms of police violence and even renders it inevitable. This talk makes this case by ethnographically exploring how scenario trainings work, how they produce the prepared officer subject, foreclose alternate futures, and clinch the primacy of officer safety. My point here is not to offer alternative policy proposals, but rather to challenge pervasive thinking on existing proposals that are recycled with each new crisis in police legitimacy. So I'll begin by explaining what I mean by police common sense then exploring how scenario trainings calibrate fear by producing a colorblind commonsensical tactical awareness. Next, I trace how officers learn to inhabit command presence, a heteromasculine habitus of state power that teaches officers how to simultaneously embody authority, and vulnerability to control the racialized poor. I then examine virtual scenario trainings, often vaunted under a technophilic reform paradigm for their potential to produce better uses of force. I suggest that rather than undoing police fear, virtual reality powerfully justifies it by materializing a subjunctive certainty that threat could exist. Finally, I discuss the stakes of these arguments for reform efforts, arguing that they immunize policing against substantive reform. So just very briefly to define terms, I define police common sense as a collectively generated, semi-systematized practical approach to this tension of embodying both authority and vulnerability. And I'm borrowing from Antonio Gramsci's, <coughs> excuse me, formulation of common sense as an accretion of pragmatic received wisdoms, which suture together mutually contradictory elements without resolving their tensions. Uh, Stuart Hall and Alan O'Shea argue, and I quote, the virtue of common sense is that it is obvious. Its watchword is, of course, it seems to be outside time. And while Hall and O'Shea, like Gramsci, are more concerned with popular common sense, here I'm looking at how specifically police common sense is produced through the practical inculcation of tactical thinking, which emerges from a specific historical and colonial genealogy, but seems to exist outside time. So police common sense to wrap up this part frames officer safety as the unquestionable perpetually threatened foundation of police work to which tactical thinking is the pragmatic solution. And police common sense contains stories that seem to contradict one another. Officers are rightful holders of ultimate authority. Officers are vulnerable. Threat is colorblind. Threat is the unruly black body. I'm not trying to set you up to think you'll get killed on every call or to make you paranoid, a SWAT team officer told a class of recruits. Don't approach a suicidal with a gun call the way you would a barking dog call, but also can anything happen? Yes. On a sunny spring morning, SWAT team members were leading a module on basic tactical maneuvers. The Baltimore Police Department was laboring under a consent decree nearby and departments nationally were talking the language of reform. Even in departments like this one, which of course I'll keep anonymous, um, which enjoyed a clean reputation with its majority white population, academic, uh, sorry, academy training had self-consciously shifted to signal its commitment to a guardian mindset. Recruits wrote personal mission statements and learned about trauma-informed care. But nonetheless, at the indisputable core of academy pedagogy was the common sense mantra that officer safety comes first. Tactical maneuvers training started inside a classroom adorned with posters proclaiming catchphrases like, you can never have enough bullets, 
then moved outside for scenario exercises. Recruits learned how to approach buildings, move through rooms, and consider angles from which someone could shoot them. You always have to be aware, set yourself up in case it breaks bad, the SWAT officer explained. It'll be 1% of calls, but you have to always be thinking tactically. Tactical thinking meant that one must play the what if game, he said, even in the least threatening situations. What if someone ambushes me from that shed during a noise complaint call? What if I arrive at a mental health check and someone walks out waving a shovel? Where will I stand, run, hide, aim? From their first week in academy, these recruits were indoctrinated into prioritizing officer safety. They were initially instructed to stand against the wall while waiting in the hallways outside their classroom and to not make eye contact with passersby like these recruits. Gradually, they were taught to scan people up and down without saying a word. Finally, they were allowed to greet passersby with good morning, sir or ma'am. The point was that they should think threat first, the supervisor told me. They should learn to see everyone as potential threats and size them up quickly, then acknowledge their presence. This layering of concerns with personal security before politeness points to the heart of police common sense. A readiness mindset, an attitude of ceaseless contingency planning should naturally be one's primary mandate. Furthermore, this awareness should theoretically exceed or precede race and gender. Anybody could threaten. The SWAT team members attempted to translate this mindset into the praxis of police common sense. Never turn your back on any potential threat, they instructed recruits. When approaching a house, always glance into parked cars to make sure nobody's there. Think threat first, then layer on your communications, your mental health training, your de-escalation. Training officers frequently emphasize that thinking threat should mostly remain undetected, present only in recruits' minds. Only in that 1% of cases will they need to manifest their calculations and take action in the world. You should treat every inmate like they're about to escape, a corrections officer told the recruits in a later academy module. Like you treat every person like they might have the worst disease, like you treat every call like anything could happen. You don't necessarily act on it, but you have it in your head. So in other words, it's not that everyone is a threat, it's that anyone could be, and therefore officers must continually envision how to mitigate that threat. One officer referred to the proper threat preparedness mindset as the duck analogy. Quote, the duck looks graceful as shit, but underneath is paddling hard. One never sees the feet. This distinction between awareness and action was tactically important for many trainers. If officers were to see actual threat rather than its potentiality everywhere, their constant fear could incapacitate their decision-making capacity with dire results. For one, this could produce impulsive reactions and therefore departmental liability. Someone holding a cell phone in the dark and you getting too close and getting scared is how cops mess up and shoot unarmed people, a SWAT officer told recruits in a nod to any number of killings as they practiced an overdose call. Fearful reactive officers might also become visibly anxious, which trainers explained can undermine police authority. As a training supervisor counseled recruits, quote, the biggest thing is don't come in tense. Not everyone's out to kill you. Be aware, but relax. There's a big difference between being nervous and being aware. If you're nervous, shitbags are going to see it. Shitbags being their term of art. The ideal mode of thinking threat, in short, remains silent and produces a kind of preparedness indiscernible to the public eye. Beneath the surface, officers should be watching their angles, scanning for observation points, and paddling like hell. So scenario trainings then channel fear into the police common sense of tactical awareness. Thinking threat doesn't translate straightforwardly to trigger happy, but rather to a confident, calm mindset of preparedness. And indeed, trainings encouraged restraint where possible and emphasized tailoring force to context, which reproduced officers as professional violence experts. Moreover, the threat that these experts would face was presented as anonymous, a free-floating signifier detached from racialized bodies thereby skirting charges of racism while preparing officers for threat conceived as simultaneously everywhere and anywhere. Furthermore, scenarios figuring of threat as potentially ubiquitous or ubiquitously potential implicitly co-produced this common sense vision of officers as vulnerable. If one's own body is killable at anyone's hands, if anything can happen, thinking threat first was simply a natural response. 
Scenario trainings teach officers how to navigate this vulnerability by tying survival to embodied authority. Such training, as I will argue, displays the racial imaginaries simmering beneath these purportedly colorblind mandates to think threat. It also reveals the contradictions regnant within police common sense. For police, all situations involving officers are understood to be safer for everyone when the officer maintains control, with anarchy and outright terror threatening those who do not. Recruits learn that their elementary tool for exercising control is command presence or the unspoken language of authority, which ideally manifests police dominance and professionalism in the form of demeanor, tone, and attire. It thereby signals that the officer is in charge and not to be questioned. Police often view this display of strength as a kind of de-escalation tactic. If officers project their authority, civilians will be less likely to challenge or attack them. Trainers therefore work to imbue underconfident recruits with an ability to command. During one academy module, recruits were funneled through a series of multi-person role play scenario exercises designed to test their command presence. Other officers from the agency played the role of civilians in various scenarios while academy instructors observed. In one exercise, two volunteer officers sat in a parked car while one recruit at a time play acted performing a routine traffic stop. The instructor told the volunteers that when the recruit begins the stop, quote, jump out and act like a flaming asshole. If they bring good, strong command presence and show they're in charge, then you calm down and get back in the car. If they're acting all shy and sheepish like yesterday and don't put on their big boy pants, then you escalate. Recruits who managed to subdue the unruly civilians did so by loudly insisting that they get back in the car, while those who struggled to assert dominance had to face mind shootouts. The exercise concretized the link between a failure to project authority and inevitable violence. Like policing itself, command presence hinges on an embodied heteromasculinity, stereotypically requiring a booming voice and imposing stature. Those whose bodies deviate from the prototypical large white man are considered more vulnerable to disrespect and attack. So in order to maintain officer safety, they must mimic or even exceed hegemonically masculine traits. For instance, one academy class I observed had a short woman recruit, we'll call Michelle, who often hesitated in scenario exercises and spoke politely when she was meant to be aggressive. Her instructors frequently complained out of earshot that she was shy and nervous, traits unbefitting an officer. However, when Michelle did act with confidence, they praised her effusively. During one exercise that required recruits to catch, search, and maintain control of a fleeing volunteer, Michelle grabbed the volunteer, quote, like she owned him, her instructor gushed. He told her afterward that, quote, you may have to take your authority up a notch as both a small female and a new cop. You'll be challenged, so you may have to escalate more quickly. Trainers translated a pragmatic recognition of how authority operates socially. Recruits like Michelle could not manifest authority as legibly as large men into the expectation that their safety would require escalated force. In order to command the obedience required for officer safety, recruits had to cultivate a convincingly dominant masculine affect and resort to violence if that affect failed to produce proper compliance. Such command presence scenarios also highlighted who was imagined as the main targets of heteromasculine control. For instance, the largely white volunteer officers playing civilians often jokingly mimicked black complaints of police quote, fuck you, why do you stop me? Is it the color of my skin? One role-playing white officer asked a white recruit attempting to make a traffic stop. During another exercise, the instructor distinguished the level of command presence they considered necessary in Greenville, the poorer blacker district, from what was required in the whiter, wealthier Springfield. Quote, maybe it's different in Springfield, but in Greenville, they'll walk all over you, he explained. You have to maintain control. Four Black residents were figured as adversarial threats to that control, an image confirmed during a difficult scenario, a noise complaint call where a crowd of 10 volunteers pretended to be holding a party. Be mouthy, the instructor told volunteers before recruits arrived. You've all been in Greenville. While recruits performed the exercise, the volunteers ignored them, comically taunted them, and imitated the discourses of hyper-policed Black communities. So here, command presence clearly had an object unruly and uncooperative black civilians 
Officers who were otherwise concerned not to appear racist took few pains to hide from me this common sense understanding, which was shared by many interlocutors across different agencies. Black civilians were figured as more likely to act disorderly, resist arrest, and otherwise merit aggressive attempts at control, a belief often articulated as simply realistic and therefore, quote, not about race. This understanding of non-compliance was simply the tip of anti-Black contempt and dehumanization. Officers marked poor Black neighborhoods as, quote, problem areas or, quote, shitholes. A few officers noted casually that they could do more in poor Black areas, i.e. get away with more violations, under the banner of suppressing crime and asserting authority. A retired Black officer and reform advocate who I interviewed criticized officers who deploy more violent and invasive tactics in poor Black neighborhoods, whereas, quote, they can't abuse white, pe can't abuse white people. They know that, too. You'll lose your job quick. Scholars, Black liberation movements, and residents of hyper-police neighborhoods have leveled and lived this argument for generations. As Robin D.G. Kelly argues, members of poor Black communities, quote, targeted by the state are not considered rights-bearing individuals to be protected, but criminals poised to violate the law who thus require vigilant watch, not unlike prisoners. This marking operates at the level of police harassment of and violence against Black civilians, justified by what Khalil Gibran Muhammad calls, quote, the ideological currency of Black criminality or the indexing of Blackness as inherently criminal. It also operates in the racial imaginaries of white supremacy, in which Black people are what Christina Sharp calls the carriers of terror, terror's embodiment, rather than in reality, the, quote, ground of terror's possibility. The concept of command presence has historically received criticism precisely for facilitating anti-Black police terror. For instance, the Christopher Commission's 1991 evaluation of the Los Angeles Police Department's use of excessive force linked command presence to needless confrontations. However, it's also important to note that long before command presence materializes as physical violence, it envisions and inculcates through pedagogic and experiential common sense a racialized object of control, the quote, thug poised to attack the weak and unimposing who understands only the language of dominance. So the racial, to wrap up this section, the racial imagination of command presence and its embodied heteromasculinity represent a micro scale expression of state power. The institution of US policing as is now much more widely understood is rooted in slave patrols and colonial occupation as Marcus Dubber argues, it also traces its lineage to the nearly limitless authority of the ancient Greek patriarch. These founding and interlocking themes echo throughout the teaching of command presence. Scenario trainings transform the human material of the police recruit into a physical embodiment of state power, fostering a habitus designed to convey indisputable authority in order to absolutely control the racialized poor. At the same time, trainings fundamentally acknowledge the tenuousness of that authority and pivot around an attentiveness to the officer's own vulnerability. Command presence scenario training therefore illuminates the tension of holding police power in one's body. On the one hand, the notion that control and authority naturally belong to police as wearers of the badge and agents of the state is considered commonsensical. On the other, that control is figured less as a moral imperative of enforcing allegiance to the law and more as a contingent and foundational necessity for officer survival, for the survival of the threatened human body representing governmental authority. Scenario trainings teach that body how to envision and defend its vulnerability by asserting heteromasculine and white supremacist dominance. These core mandates of role play scenarios that I've been talking about, thinking threat first, navigating authority and vulnerability, all within a nominally colorblind frame, reach their zenith in virtual reality or VR simulators. VR scenarios starkly highlight the seduction of police common sense and reveal how it forecloses alternate futures. As Black-led movements against US police violence peaked in public attention in 2014 to 2016, VR simulators received favorable media coverage for their promise to immersively and accurately mimic police worlds and to therefore help trainees suppress fear, minimize use of force, and develop better judgment under realistically stressful conditions. VR platforms by companies such as Axon, Vertra, and Apex Officer 
claim to provide a simulated realism too expensive or difficult for in-person role play to emulate using professional actors or photorealistic graphics and large scenario libraries with various backdrops. Using VR headsets or videos projected onto walls or panels, simulators play pre-programmed scenarios in which characters can react automatically to the officer's actions, such as dropping to the ground when shot in the head or screaming when shot in the arm, or in some programs can be directed by the simulator's operator to respond appropriately. For instance, if an officer gives a convincing verbal command, the operator can select an option for man gets on his knees rather than man gets hostile. Optimism around VR police training emerges from a long genealogy of technophilia in police reform. For instance, technological fixes to racialized violence such as body cameras gained wide currency after the 2014 Ferguson uprising. Such efforts arguably fit within a tradition of liberal reformism in which police violence is figured as a deviation from the ordinary to be corrected with technocratic solutions rather than as the systemic anti-Black grounding of the carceral system and American democracy itself. Whereas VR claims to offer technical solutions to both perceived lacuna in police training and the broader problematics of racialized violence, I argue that VR scenarios instead naturalize and justify that violence by powerfully materializing the omnipresence of threat within circumscribed worlds. VR scenarios might lack the phenomenological experience of in-person role play, but they nonetheless offer a unique brand of realism, within which, as I discovered in my introduction to one agency simulator, police common sense prefigures the only supposedly reasonable responses. In the center of a simulator like this one, the room darkened, I stood empty handed next to my officer interlocutor. A training instructor switched on the program and projected onto the walls a wraparound image of the lobby of a police station, the very station in which we stood. Explaining that the software allowed them to insert their own photographs, he watched with us as actors on screen moved realistically against the backdrop of the lobby, playing employees and visitors. The instructor then demonstrated various scenarios in which a shooter attacks the police station, strolling into the lobby and opening fire, popping out from a hallway, ambushing officers in the parking lot. Such scenarios, up, the instructor said, aim to inculcate constant vigilance. He demonstrated with another one in the station's parking lot. The scene opens on a woman lying on the pavement, groaning and clutching her bloody stomach. A little girl stands nearby, looking unruffled, apparently playing with a phone. Suddenly, the phone is a gun, and she shoots at you. The captain explained that if you shoot back and then try to render aid, another woman may leap out from behind the car and fire at you as well. In the world imagined by these station scenarios, threat lurks in the shadows of your own workplace. A shooter stalks the familiar hallways, mowing down innocents until stopped. Actors play your colleagues, dying on the floors you may cross a dozen times a day. Most other scenarios that I later observed use the software's inbuilt backgrounds, but the shooting at the station scenarios illuminated an important facet of officer survival thinking. They invited officers to viscerally inhabit their own environment as potentially besieged. At any point, things could go south and you need to be prepared. The little girl scenario also invoked the unpredictability of sudden violence, leaving unaddressed the absurdity of a small child shooting a woman in a police department parking lot. What mattered was not understanding the girl's motives, but rather calculating for and defending against even remote dangers, not reason, but survival. The tabula rasa shooter hammered home the message that probabilities mattered less than possibilities. If it could happen, no matter how unlikely, it must be prepared for. This message was repeated over and over in a multi-hour VR scenario training I observed at an academy. Recruits entered the darkened simulator in ones and twos, armed with training guns and deactivated tasers while their classmates watched. Their instructor, who I'll call Adam, ran recruits through various scenarios, each oriented around a clear lesson. Not all were deadly, but all sought to inculcate police common sense. In one scenario, you must kill a white woman's dog or risk it attacking you or a playground full of children. In another, you shoot a white man who draws a gun during a traffic stop. 
there's no such thing as a low risk traffic stop, Adam reminded the recruits. After you've shot him, what do you do first? The recruits, uncertain, stumbled over their answers. Render aid? No, he could have another gun, Adam said. You maintain lethal coverage, then search him, then render aid. So here, the police logic of threat operated at odds with notions of care, which had to be drummed out of the recruits. They had to learn to think threat first. Unlike in role play scenarios, however, if you chose to first help someone you just shot, the simulator could punish your decency with terrifying realism. Perhaps the wounded driver will whip out a second gun as you try to stanch his bleeding. Perhaps, as in the little girl scenario, someone else will spring out to put a bullet through your head. While simulators can also be used for trainings on subjects such as implicit bias and bystander intervention, interestingly, in public demonstrations, they're often used for shoot or don't shoot scenarios to stress the practicality of police common sense. In a 2014 special called Cops Under Fire, for instance, CNN's Don Lemon played his studio audience a shoot or don't shoot simulator video, which emphasized that refusing to abide by police pragmatism inevitably produces worse violence. In the scenario, a domestic violence scene between a white couple, a man screams and curses at a woman, his face contorted as he shoves her against a wall. Lemon paused the video with the man's right hand out of sight. How many of you would shoot, he asked. Few of the mostly black audience members polled said that they would. Aside from, inexplicably, an attorney for Darren Wilson, the former police officer who killed Michael Brown. Wilson's attorney sagely explained that the man will harm you or the woman. So not only can you legally shoot him, but perhaps you should. Lemon then played out the video revealing that the man indeed is holding a gun, but she turns on the woman and then on you. Lemon chided his audience, quote, the woman ends up dead, the officer could end up dead, and the suspect ends up dead as well, right? My own experience in a simulator similarly revealed the ideological seduction of virtual training. Throughout my fieldwork, officers labored to conscript me into police common sense, telling me, for instance, that they hoped trainings opened my eyes to the law enforcement profession, and by implication, the reasonableness of their thinking. VR scenarios offered a powerful way for them to demonstrate to me the utter futility of resisting police common sense. During a break between recruit groups, Adam handed me a training gun and played a scenario that opens with a call for a fired black employee who is refusing to leave his employer's premises. The employee sits in a pickup truck outside a building as his boss pleads through the truck window for him to leave. Suddenly the boss yells, he's got a gun and rushes back inside this exact scene, in fact. Adam paused the scene to ask what I would do. I guess look for cover and talk to him, I said, fumbling for the most peaceful option. So talk to him, Adam said. Mimicking the language I had heard in trainings, I began repeating, hey man, come out and talk to me. It doesn't have to be like this. The man slowly emerges from his pickup, holding a gun to his temple and walks toward the building. I watched helplessly as he enters, then with several shots and screaming, the scenario ends. Did it make you think? Adam asked. What did you just allow to happen? You allowed someone who's been fired to go back into his workplace and kill people. Could you justify shooting him before he got there? Yes, you had to shoot him. Adam could have chosen a de-escalatory option once I began talking to the character, but he aimed to prove that from the moment the man stepped out with a gun, you could rightfully kill him, and perhaps you should. Whether in another world, in another programmed decision point, he could have dropped the gun, that was immaterial. What was material was the single branching path that led the man to commit mass murder, to threaten your safety and the safety of innocent civilians. That path foreclosed all the others. Such scenarios, redolent of American fears of mass shootings, statistically unlikely yet ubiquitous, with the archetypally white mass shooter played by a black man, are both real and unreal. Others make real the fear of a gunman stalking your precinct's halls, a second shooter, a phone that is a gun. If in real life, someone holding a gun may not necessarily shoot at an officer, in the simulator, they almost certainly will. And can you afford to wait and see? What did you just allow to happen? Whether or not the threat materializes is almost a moot point. 
In Don Lemon's paused scenario, for instance, the abusive man's out of sight hand exists in a state of quantum uncertainty, a Schrodinger-esque paradox of simultaneously deadly and non-deadly violence. Once observed, the hand collapses into one or the other as it is revealed to hold a gun or to be balled into a fist. Yet the quantum uncertainty at the moment of decision-making generates its own form of certainty, that the scenario contains the possibility of a gun. The point here is not that the gun is never there or that mass shootings are non-existent. It's that scenarios do not simply suppress fear as reformers hope but rather reorient it around a logic of preparedness enclosed in the immediacy of the present. These survivalist lessons unfold in their own grammar, their own mood. Threat assessments primarily function not in the simple past tense, what did in reality happen, nor even in the future-oriented calculus of what was likely to happen. They operate instead in the subjunctive mood, in the conditional logic, what might be, what could have been. As Chloe Amon says, subjunctive politics, quote, impose an economy of choices by foreclosing certain futures, making choices appear as if they were the only ones. In the simulator, the many logical potential outcomes of a situation are eclipsed by the subjunctive certainty that threat could exist in this very moment. This foreclosure in turn induces a radical presentism. If you don't somehow stop the fired employee right now, he could kill you or his coworkers, and thereby renders inevitable the force required to stop threat and live. When Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd in 2020, many writers and activists pointed out that the Minneapolis Police Department had been considered a model of progressive reform. The department offered numerous trainings on reformers' wish lists, including scenarios. Yet such training did not stop Chauvin from murdering Floyd. <clears throat> Moreover, Chauvin himself was the field training officer responsible for guiding new officers in the field, as was Kimberly Potter, the Minneapolis officer who killed 20-year-old Dante Wright as Chauvin's trial unfolded in April 2021. Since George Floyd's murder, abolitionist ideas drawing on the longstanding work of Black feminist thinkers like Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Miriam Kaba gained broad circulation among a public increasingly disillusioned with the promises of reform. Growing numbers of organizers, progressive politicians, and even some police themselves have advocated for investing more in housing, healthcare, and other social support, and for shifting certain duties away from police. Some police reformers, however, continued to turn to training, framing it as a vital antidote to police violence. Absent from the reformist assumption that trainings can be improved is often the question of how trainings work in practice. Not only how they might be imperfect at preventing future Chauvin's or Potter's, but how even the most promising training reforms reinscribe and intensify racialized violence. As protests continue and reform bills pass into state and national legislatures, as cities like Atlanta, shovel millions into new police training facilities and arrest and kill protesters, the stakes of grasping how trainings work have rarely been higher. So to wrap up, police common sense is ideologically persuasive because it collapses the use of state-sanctioned white supremacist force into a colorblind decision legitimized by what could have been. It provides a framework for negotiating the tensions of embodying state power and a deliberately structured vulnerability. It is so apparently timeless and self-justifying that even its critics often leave speaking in its terms. Finally, it helps forge a hermetically sealed worldview that excludes systemic critique and blocks all other logics. Any effort to improve US police through training is filtered through the logics of officer safety. These logics, excuse me, these logics help absorb and tame critiques of the policing institution thereby rendering it impervious to substantive change. They reproduce anti-Blackness while sealing police violence into an airtight vision of the world, governed by presentist, perpetually subjunctive logics. Scenario trainings designed to suppress fear can't alter the presupposition that fear for one's life justifies violence even when the gun is just a phone. And in fact, they help naturalize that violence. Reality-based trainings can't change the deeply ingrained notion that officers must be prepared for inevitable threat. And in fact, they frame that threat in intimately imagined details. 
training reforms may reinforce police legitimacy and serve as rationales to siphon more public funds into police departments, but they do not remake and indeed often strengthen the pragmatics of officer survival. Thus, attempts to reckon with the violence of police training run aground on the unassailable shoals and the seductive inevitability of police common sense. Thank you. That was incredibly powerful. Thank you so much, Jessica, um, for really uh, um, intense and enlightening uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, so I have just one question and then I'm gonna open it up for Q and A. Um, uh, when uh, so much of what you described makes complete sense to me um, uh, as a, a kind of, motivation and kind of justification for police violence, um, especially against people of color, black people in particular. Um, but it's hard to to hear your talk and to think about a couple of prominent examples, many examples, where it it seems to me it'd be really difficult to make any argument about the threat. It, it almost you know feels like people are out for kicks or police people, police are out for kicks. Um, and perhaps there's more that I would need to know about different situations. But when I think about um, what we've learned so far about Tyree Nichols, where's the, the sense of threat, the amplified fear there? And again, maybe we just need to know more. It sounds like a, a kind of group or gang of men who were interested in having fun by brutalizing another man's body. Um, and so they did it because they could, because they didn't expect to be um, um, treated in any way. I, I feel the same when I think about Laquan McDonald in, in Chicago or Walter Scott in North Charleston. There are any number of situations. Now, I certainly do think that there are examples that completely fit what you just described. I'm not sure about the situation. I'm freaked out. I mean, and, you know, you're ready to shoot or, or uh, escalate in these ways. But there's so many, it, it, there do seem to be, there's, there does seem to be a subset of these cases where it's hard to see where the fear comes in. It just, it feels as if I'm in a position where I can control another person completely and there will be no uh, consequences to me for doing so. And so I do it. Um, it. It's unclear to me that training has anything to do with it, except that you can then justify it by saying, by you know, coming up with a story about how you had experienced fear. To what extent does your um, research kind of help us to understand these other instances of violence that seem to me to be disconnected altogether from trainings that, uh, whether it's the simulations or, um, or other forms of training that kind of amplify the sense of fear and make it so that people are like responding before any real threat occurs these other situations where there is no threat. They're just these, these vulnerable bodies and uh, a set of folks who have the power uh, um, and no you know, source of accountability so they can just do what they want. Um, am I, does that make sense? I get what you're saying. It's a powerful, I think, explanation for what is happening. And also, uh, it also explains why on some level, police can't be touched, right? This is just a perfect, uh, what you're describing is just a kind of perfect um, way of shielding them um, from any kind of accountability. They're at one point vulnerable, but also in some ways kind of all powerful. But what about these other instances where it just doesn't, it doesn't connect? Um, how do we understand those situations? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I actually struggled a little bit with including the Thierry Nichols case at the beginning of this talk, because you're right, I don't think we've seen anything to suggest that the officers are even claiming that they were afraid. Um, so I, you know, I don't mean to be offering a kind of totalizing explanation for police behavior, because of course, like you said, there's, there's a sense of impunity, there's a sense of like, not just empowerment as an agent of the state, but like personal empowerment, the kind of bullying mentality that we see. Um, there's obviously personal racism um, at stake uh, among other issues. 
Um, but I think, um, I mean, one thing we certainly see, and I, you know, there wasn't much space to get into this, but I'm sure there are other people on the call who are very familiar with this too. Um, we certainly see officers, no matter how they personally feel, right, being trained to, um, being trained to say that they were afraid. Um, uh, and even in, you know, I, I haven't watched the video, but um, reading analyses of it, um, uh, you know, officers claiming that he was going for their gun. Um, uh, or like in the Walter Scott case, um, uh, uh, what was his name? The officer claimed that um, Scott was, you know, trying to go for his taser. Um, and, you know, sometimes videos show that those, those claims are correct. And many times they show that they weren't, including in the, in, with Terry Nichols. Um, so, you know, I think that's where it gets difficult to kind of disentangle um, what officers may individually feel, which is part of like, you know, the ideology is, is kind of what I'm focused on in this talk, but I think it definitely is hard to disentangle that from the legal architecture that allow and the legal infrastructure that allows police to um, uh, literally get away with murder by claiming to be afraid, even in cases where we might, you know, look at it from the outside and say, of course, there's no way that you could be. Um, so I think that's a piece of it, that officer survival is both, uh, you know, an ideology, it is like a, a way of um, embodying one's position in the world, one's place in the world, and it's a legal, um, it, it's the basis of a legal excuse for even the most um, egregious and obvious forms of violence as we saw last week. And we couldn't possibly know what it would feel like to be in their shoes because things happen and how do you make the set decisions in such a split second kind of way. Um, I really appreciate your response. Um, we have a couple of questions in the in the chat um, that we can get to here. I'm going to start with uh, Leonard's um, question. Uh, and that is, well, Leonard might want to ask himself, uh, but if memory serves, uh, Leonard um, preferred that I ask last week, so I'll go to this week. Jessica, are protocols in effect to filter new hires based on standard psychological assessments to eliminate those prone to aggression or racism? In, in general, how do uh, um, police departments kind of sort out those who they will allow to engage in their training? Yeah, thanks, Leonard. That's a good question. Um, I mean, I think like everything else in this country, it depends on the state, right? And I'm most familiar with Maryland, um, where I did my field work. Um, uh, and even there, I think it depends honestly on the agency. And so a couple of things. One part of the issue is that, you know, as I'm sure everyone's seen reported in the news, um, police departments are struggling to recruit the numbers that they say they need, especially in places um, like Baltimore um, with high homicide rates, and at least according to the police department and police union, low um, staffing. So, you know, departments, I think um, a lot of departments that, you know, are, are at a, uh, facing a lack of qualified candidates um, may not necessarily be inclined, and many in fact are not, um, to implement psychological assessments. Um, it's another thing that I think, um, you know, one of one of the issues that critical scholars of police have pointed to is that, of course, individual racism matters, and you ideally don't want somebody with obvious anti-black thinking um, or you know white supremacist tendencies on your police force. That's important, but policing is a systemically racist institution. Um, so you know, I think eliminating people with, again, for instance, like you know white supremacist group ties, um, which even that I think we've not nationally managed to um, put a lot of energy into. Um, that would be harm reducing, I think, um, but it would certainly not um, eliminate and necessarily even mitigate the violence, the systemic racism and violence of, of policing. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, so fairly recently, we had uh, a police killing um, in Cambridge. Uh, this is uh, where a young man was was killed by police, and there have been um, 
uh, calls for um, a focus on police training, et cetera, in the context of Cambridge. And I think with that in mind, Naomi has asked, um, first has praised your talk as brilliant, lucid, and persuasive. Um, completely agreed. Um, but she has, asks, has anyone studied the training specifically in Cambridge? Is it significantly different or does it fit this analysis? Um, I'm not sure that you have paid much attention to how police are trained within Cambridge, Jessica. Um, if so, I'll provide you with this opportunity. If not, we'll see if others um, in our community know much about training in, in Cambridge. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear from others. I'm still relatively new to Cambridge and I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, I imagine, or at least I would be curious to hear um, what folks who do know more about, about this department um, think about this, but certainly one thing that I've found in Maryland, which should really, you know, is not, is not surprising, um, is that, you know, the, the kind of abolitionist ideal of policing as showing up only when, you know, when there is a domestic violence case or, you know, when, when police, when armed officers are genuinely called for, um, that that sort of ideal um, is what wealthy white communities have. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so I'd be, I'd be curious to hear how that um, fits or, or doesn't fit here. Excellent. Katie, do you do you know much about um, how Cambridge police are trained? I know some, and I also know that um, the police commissioner has been answering some questions over the last couple of weeks in community meetings um, where there's some video recorded online if, if folks want to watch. But one thing that I brought up in response to Naomi's question in the chat is that um, the Middlesex County Sheriff's Office about a decade ago bought a virtual reality trailer in which police can do precisely the kinds of, uh, you know, enhanced use of force trainings that Jessica studied um, and and offers it to police agencies across the region in Middlesex County, which is where Cambridge is based. And Cambridge Police has used that training for its officers for a number of years now. I, I dropped in the chat the minutes of the Cambridge Police Review and Advisory Board from December of 21 saying they were working on scheduling that training for the third year running. So I I think this this talk is very on topic for thinking about how uh, the Cambridge police is, is trained in use of force. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we have another really um, interesting question in the in the chat, Jessica, and that is from Lloyd. Um, he asks, um, do you doubt that police are in fact subject to unpredictable threat? Um, if so, on what basis? And I don't hear you saying that. Um, I hear you saying that it's an amplified <laughs> uh, perception of threat, some of which they're trained to think is the case, but I'll let you respond. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely it. Um, and I really appreciate it, actually. I just saw that Katie posted um, a, a link, lots of useful information, but also a, a link to um, Jordan Blair Wood's study um, on police danger narratives. And for anyone who's not familiar that um, study looks at um, how common it actually is that the police face uh, violence, particularly deadly violence at traffic stops. Since, you know, as I alluded to also in my talk, um, police are often told that traffic stops are the most dangerous um, routine thing that they could do. So um, on the one hand, yes, I think it's fairly clear from um, the, the sort of empirical studies that we have that the idea that policing is, um, you know, on an encounter by encounter basis, particularly dangerous, um, is not um, empirically true, but that's not at all to say that I think um, officers don't face unpredictable threat. I think they absolutely do. And part of that, sometimes that is um, officer created jeopardy, um, I think is, is the term. Um, but sometimes it's not. Um, uh, and, you know, we, the rise of mass shootings across this, this country um, has, has shown that to be the case. So my argument is not that, um, you know, that, that police danger narratives um, are completely overblown and there's absolutely nothing to them and none of them ever put themselves at risk. That's, of course, not true. Um, but it's to say that I think Number one, as Woods argues, that those narratives are often sort of over, that the dangerous aspects are often overemphasized. And number two, that separate from the kind of empirical part of this analysis, 
we also need to look critically at what those danger narratives are doing for policing and what they are doing to the people who are on the other end of those narratives. Thanks for that, Jessica. Um, and your, your last comment reminded me of a kind of brilliant New York Times um, interactive about how it is that police, um, especially when engaging in traffic stops, actually create situations of, of danger that they then respond to. Um, and so I uh, placed that in the link um, as well. But um, there's a question in the chat uh, from Bob, who um, has asked that I ask his question for him. Um, Bob says that having just attended a use of force um, with simulator train, training um, as a community police pre, uh, preview board member or review board member, um, I was struck by the emphasis on presenting the stresses officers face in the moment of a shoot, not shoot decision. My takeaway, training does, and training basically goes out the window in those moments. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I've also um, been, I was, I joined a, uh, as part of my field work, joined a, um, uh, um, oh my God, what are they called? A Citizens Police Academy. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of had us um, uh, do these kind of, these kind of simulations also in, in just like role playing. Um, and, you know, something that even officers themselves complain about, and particularly the kind of better trained officers like SWAT team officers, is that, you know, in direct answer to your question is yes, if you do not practice your responses on a regular basis, um, if you are just um, engaging in these kind of scenarios uh, once every year for your in-service trainings, um, then yeah, the, the kind of bodily comportment and, you know, like with the military, like with any, anything that require, like athletes to use a less violent example, um, anything that you're not practicing regularly, um, you do uh, tend to kind of um, forget that the sort of embodied part of that training uh, in the moment. And I, you know, I do want to say that I don't think that means that um, officers therefore need to go through more of those trainings. I think we also have, um, you know, I think there's, there's, and I'm not saying that you're saying this, but just to kind of build off of this, I think that there's a tendency to think that or to believe that you know these shootings tend to happen on impulse and that is often true but we also have plenty of examples of like very highly trained SWAT team officers for instance um, uh, committing you know incredible forms of violence Breonna Taylor, Tatiana Jefferson um, so uh, that's just kind of a, an, an add-on as a caution against the idea of relying on that relying on the idea that if we can just like professionalize police and have them go through more of these trainings, which is something that police themselves would argue. Um, I think that's something that we should not rely on. I was already off, unmuted. Um, so Katie has uh, placed in the chat another set of articles to help us. Um, understand um, from various scholars, mostly from, it seems like, Stanford, Katie. Um, <laughs> um, but then the, I think an, an obvious question or one that I think many would have, Jessica, is is how do, how do we do differently? Um, are there any, and this is, this is uh, uh, not a fair question. Are there any police departments that don't engage in this kind of training or is this so widespread that we should take for granted this is just how police in the U.S. are trained? Um, and, and what would we do differently? Because if I'm hearing you correctly, the, if training is going to be the focus of how we try to address uh, police, uh, uh, poor police outcomes, um, and so we're funneling billions of dollars essentially into more of this kind of training. We should expect more of these kinds of results um, and justifications and motivations for, for what um, happens. How do we respond in this situation? What would you recommend um, um, should be our next steps? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> I think the best, the best answer I have um, so uh, Ruth Wilson Gomer makes a distinction between reformist and non-reformist reform. So non-reformist being 
ones that don't give more power or funding to policing. Um, and that is something I have found helpful in thinking about um, harm reduction. Um, you know, if there are trainings that, you know, don't give more money to police, but that, um, you know, teach them something about, you know, for instance, adolescent psychology, um, uh, that, you know, they need to know, then maybe that's something that could reduce harm. I think also just in general, um, shifting public resources away from police departments. Um, I, I didn't go into my field work as an abolitionist, but I came out as one um, partly through seeing, um, yes, thank you, Katie. Yeah, critical resistance is a great resource for this also. Um, and uh, anything Miriam Kaba writes. Um, yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, I would, for me, that's kind of the template that I use um, and, and the, with the sort of caveat of being generally suspicious of anything that increases the legitimacy of police departments. Um, I think it's also something to pay attention to. So yeah, I don't have a great answer to what we should do instead besides um, shift resources away from police departments, particularly for anything that doesn't involve responding to um, uh, immense violence. Um, I appreciate that very much. So one other question that I have is, I mean, I think that there is a uh, maybe a sense, uh, and, and maybe I'm making this up, that generally speaking, the public does not like this, um, th this level of force, um, and would prefer that we figure out some ways to reduce this level of force. But on some level, don't we, don't we accept it? Isn't this, I mean, it, because on some level it makes us feel safe, they might be kind of brutal, but at least it contains and controls populations that we're otherwise afraid of. So in some ways, I guess my question is, um, what what is your sense about how the public receives this? To what extent is the public actually interested and invested in reducing the level of violence and brutality um, to the extent that, that they might associate that violence and brutality with containing, controlling, managing populations, Black bodies, um, that much of society finds threatening. Yeah, totally. And I think that's where we find, I mean, policing has always, since we've had polls, been infinitely more popular among white and generally non-Black people um, than, than Black folks. Um, uh, and, you know, we have such an incredible amount of um, uh, propaganda, <laughs> police propaganda out there um, teaching us exactly that um, uh, police are, you know, the thin blue line. Um, you know, we've seen uh, as there has been a rise in um, violent crimes in at least some big cities across the country, um, particularly since the end of, of lockdowns, um, pandemic lockdowns. Um, we have seen even democratic politicians who purport to be slightly more progressive on crime um, and on, you know, issues of quote unquote law and order um, shifting back towards these heavy handed, um, openly sometimes racist approaches that, you know, we know from the 60s, we know from the 90s, we know from every era um, in the last 60 years. Um, uh, function to shore up mass incarceration. And I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like for, for some people, for some populations, including a lot of politicians, including like real estate developers in places like Baltimore, um, that is the goal, um, uh, creating enough fear and incarcerating enough people that levels of certain kinds of crime go down. Um, or we can at least, um, feel comforted by seeing a cop car on the streets. Um, so yeah, I think even though there has absolutely been some um, broader public buy-in to the arguments that groups like Movement for Black Lives have made, um, I think you know when there are crime scares, um, uh, we really run up against the, the limits of that buy-in. And I think part of that, you know, I, I um, Miriam Kaba and other abolitionists talk about the that as a you know limitation on our imagination. Um, uh, that you know the idea that police are all that we have to address interpersonal violence um, 
is a limit of the imagination. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. So we have two more, I think, questions in the chat that I'm, I'm going to ask you both and you will take them and that will likely take us home. Um, the first is from Robert, who says a uh, Vera Institute report shows that non-serious low-level offenses such as drug abuse violations and disorderly conduct make up 80% of arrests, while serious violent offenses account for fewer than 5% of arrests. So the focus on responses to violent encounters and police training seems counterproductive to the types of non-serious encounters they actually face. Um, what should be added, supplemented to the training um, to take this into consideration? And then John asks um, or states, in part, I would suggest we need training that equips officers to deal with, control, calm, recognize their traumatized brains. We can argue that the trauma response is not rational or even that it is imposed in part by training, but without or until abolition, we have to address police on our streets. How would you respond to both their comments, questions? Yeah, thank you both. Um, Robert, yeah, I think this is something that a lot of um, people who work on police trainings, uh, of course, um, as you know, uh, struggle with. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm really in a place to make recommendations about um, dealing with um, non-serious encounters, and that's because um, the departments that I studied um, did purport to address non-serious encounters. Um, and actually, even in what I observed, a lot of the scenarios that police um, that recruits were kind of being trained on were actually non-serious encounters. Um, it was, you know, someone with a barking dog. It was like, you know, there was a lot of dog stuff, interesting. Um, uh, it was kind of low level stuff, some of which arguably police should not be dealing with at all. But aside from that sort of normative framing, um, you know, even in those, my argument here is that even in a lot of those kind of non-serious encounter trainings, um, that the same ideas that undergird police common sense, you know, the kind of priority on officer survival are still um, uh, are still kind of what leaks through and what and what comes first. Um, so basically the argument being that, at least in my field work, it wasn't possible to separate out non-serious encounter training from from police common sense. That doesn't mean that they, you know, that all of those non-serious encounters ended with someone waving a gun at them. A lot of them didn't, um, certainly more than in reality. Um, so I suppose that's something that could be calibrated. Um, but yeah, that's that's why I, you know, find myself quite skeptical about, um, uh, you know, sort of making those calibrations. Um, and John's question, um, uh, dealing with their traumatized brains. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I agree with you, I think, and I, and I think a lot of abolitionists would, would too, that it, just in the sense that, um, you know, that, that working toward abolition or something where at the very least police are not responding to what they're responding to now, um, is stepwise and needs to address present realities. Um, I guess I, you know, don't see as much harm in um, kind of teaching police good mental health practices. Um, but I would just, you know, be still be quite skeptical. One, because, you know, I've, I've seen how some of those trainings actually play out in practice. Um, uh, having those trainings on the books, of course, doesn't mean that officers take them seriously or are learning anything or that their institutions are structured to accommodate um, mental health needs, as we know from, you know, what officers themselves have said, um, you know, and um, just one more thing, I, I, I mean, this goes back to what I was saying earlier in response to someone else's question that, you know, I, I think it, it is also perfectly possible to um, help officers you know, respond better in those moments, like, you know, understand their own minds and their own trauma responses better um, and still have them kill just as many or harm just as many people um, because, you know, doing so is, is not only a product of fear and trauma. I wonder, um, Jessica, if you'd be open to answering one more question yeah, yeah. that Leslie has put in the, 
in the chat. And that is um, about scenario training that actually shows the the possible consequences of having killed an innocent person. Um, I, I guess part of the question is, did you see any training that that did that, where the officer uh, mistakenly killed someone who wasn't holding a gun and they got to see that and perhaps experience that? Um, an innocent person dead, a police officer fired, tried for murder or imprisoned for 20 years um, is what she has asked or Leslie has asked. Um, any any insight into um, these kind of alternative simulations that suggest, you know, that lead to other very different kinds of consequences? Yeah, um, no, in short, I did not see um, those kinds of consequences. And as I saw um, Robert just put in the chat, um, uh, you know, those consequences would in fact be quite unrealistic um, given what actually happens to officers um, who who harm and kill people. Um, you know, what I did see actually in in at the end of scenarios where something went wrong, where someone killed someone innocent, um, something like that, was um, the academy training instructor teaching recruits what they should say. Um, in the aftermath, um, making arguments that their survival was threatened, um, you know, basically teaching them to justify themselves under the under the letter of the law. Um, what was in uh, this is just a tiny side note. What was interesting about some of these um, simulations I saw is that there would be like a, this like brief flash at the end of the person's reaction. So like to take a very like small example, the, the one I mentioned where you have to kill a white woman's dog or risk it attacking some kids. Um, there, it like cuts to, at the very end, you like see the dog on the ground after you have shot it and you see her like screaming over the dog um, and then it ends. So like, I'm, you know, maybe there's scope for those kinds of things. I can't imagine that the companies that are producing those simulations would really want to take it any further um, because they are making their money from police departments um and uh from you know other funders who don't have any investment in uh in these kinds of outcomes um it would be interesting to see um if trainings like that um you know made any kind of difference but yeah i think it, it then ends up going back to even if they did it's even if we had those kinds of trainings it's not like uh, officers wouldn't know that in reality they are extremely unlikely to face charges much less imprisonment or any other consequences well on that happy note, happy happy note. note. <laughs> <laughs> uh jessica um katzenstein thank you so much for an incredibly powerful exceptional um um um, um, um bit of research um I, I felt like I learned uh, uh, so much. I can't wait to see this out in print, whether in article form or in book form. Um, and we certainly want to see you back here again before you leave the postdoc, um, or may, frankly, even after you um, head to your, your next appointment. Um, this was really terrific and a great way for us to begin the semester. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for this invitation, for this really great conversation and this engagement. So thank you, all of you. Thank you, Kendra.